Welcome to State Crimes Against Democracy 9-11 was an inside job. I'm your host, Bill Olson. Today we're going to be covering some, well, it's breaking news, but it's old news. Those of us in the 9-11 movement have known about Dick Cheney's deceit and lies for years, but Amy Martin from Breaking the Set on Russia Today has uh, an expose on Dick Cheney lies of 9-11, and we're going to do that roll-in. It's about a nine-minute roll-in. All our roll-ins today are from Russia Today, and they are so generous giving us written permission to play all these videos. So let's go ahead and roll the Dick Cheney video, and I'll be back in about nine minutes. Look, we all know that when it comes to any sort of judicial review of the actions or crimes of the Bush administration, Obama has made it crystal clear that he's only concerned with looking forward, not backward, on the matter. Having said that, tonight, Showtime is premiering a new film about former Vice President Dick Cheney. Check it out. If you want to really know a man's character, give him power. When I first arrived there back in 1968, I was one of the youngest people in West Wing, and uh, this time around, I was the oldest. If we had been able to take out one of those airplanes headed for the World Trade Center, would we have done it? And the answer was absolutely yes. Are you going to trade the lives of a number of people because you want to preserve your your honor? It is a wartime situation. It was more important to be successful than it was to be loved. If I had to do it over again, I'd do it in a minute. Yep. What's remarkable about this film, other than the fact that Cheney has zero regrets, is the revelation that Cheney lied when he testified alongside President Bush for the 9-11 Commission. So, why can't Cheney seem to keep his story straight? And what implications does this have for the larger narrative pushed forward by the 9-11 Commission? To discuss this and more, I'm joined by Robbie Martin, independent journalist and co-host of Media Roots Radio. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me, Abby. So, Robbie, Cheney changes his story. Let me just briefly explain why. Um, in this documentary in Showtime, he says that there was a shoot-down order, that he actually said he was going to shoot down the plane to save lives, mm -hmm. which actually contradicts the 9-11 Commission report that says that there was um, no order made. Mm -hmm. Why do you think he changed his story here? Well, because I think that he probably thought that people didn't remember that he had presidential emergency powers on that day. and. I mean, the testimony shows that Cheney, you know, was at least criminally culpable for not issuing an evacuation order from the Pentagon. Um, and on top of that, he, yeah, he was acting as emergency president at the time because Bush was in the air the whole day. Yeah, and you know what? Um, this is actually a really important aspect of this because Norman Mineta, mm -hmm. there's a really important testimony from the Transportation Secretary um, who actually testified for the Nine Island Commission. It was omitted from the official report, but he says that there was some sort of order made, and let's hear this testimony. During the time that the airplane coming in to the Pentagon, uh, there was a young man who would come in and say to the Vice President, the, the plane is 50 miles out. The plane is 30 miles out. And when it got down to the plane is 10 miles out, um, the young man also said to the vice president, do the orders still stand? And uh, the vice president turned and whipped his neck around and said, of course the orders still stand. Have you heard anything to the contrary? Okay, so here he is saying the order still stands. Cheney's mm. directing him to this. Obviously, there was an order for something. If it wasn't for a shoot-down order, what was it for? Well, that's a great question, and that's something that the American public would probably love to have answered. But the problem is that testimony never actually made it inside the commission report. So, and Norma Mineta was actually asked about that later on. I think some activist, journal, independent journalists asked him about it. And he said that he wouldn't change anything he said in that testimony. So, so Cheney, during the testimony, he said the plane's 10 miles out, 20 miles out, 30 miles out. Does the order still stand? Cheney's saying, of course they still stand. Mm -hmm. Obviously, he's talking about a plane coming close. Why do you think there wasn't an evacuation order issued from the Pentagon? Well, that's also a great question. 125 people died in the Pentagon attack alone. And I think the reason that, you know, that hasn't been uh, 
very talked, you know, it's not talked about very much that he knew of the impending plane attack because, you know, 3,000 people died on 9-11 and, you know, 125 people seems minuscule in comparison. I but mean, we're talking about criminal negligence here. Potentially, yeah. Unbelievable. Um, and, and I think a lot of other people don't realize, I briefly mentioned in the intro, that Cheney and Bush testified together, not under oath. And this is where he can't really be cl claimed for perjury or anything like that because they weren't under oath. They testified yeah. together. Let's see that Bush responding to some questions about why they did this. President, as you know, a lot of critics suggested that you wanted to appear jointly with the vice president so that you two could keep your story straight or something. Yeah. Can you tell us what you think of the value of appearing together? And how you would answer those critics? Yeah, uh, first of all, look, I mean, if we had something to hide, we wouldn't have met with them in the first place. We answered all their questions. And uh, as I say, I think I, I, I came away good about the session uh, because I wanted them to know, you know, how I set strategy, how we run the White House, how we deal with threats. Uh, the vice president answered a lot of their questions. I answered all their questions. And I think it was important for them to see our body language as well, how we work together. So, I mean, there he is, you know, it's a very bizarre answer. What, why do you think that they didn't testify under oath here together? Or, I mean, that they were together, but they didn't testify under oath? Well, I mean, they lied, first of all. I mean, I mean, who, why would someone not want to testify under oath unless they were planning on lying or, you know, obfuscating some part of the truth? And then on top of that, they testified together, not separately. I mean... I'd like to believe that Cheney was probably sitting in the corner sort of making faces at Bush, making sure he would, you know, stick to his, the story that he wanted to tell. You know, I don't know that much about body language, but I've never really seen someone look more like they were lying than him right there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he yeah, can't yeah, yeah. even get his story straight. The guy's just like, what the hell are you talking about? Let's talk <laughs> about the 9-11 Commission itself, though, because there's so many crazy inconsistencies, you know, and, and glaring omissions. But let's talk about who was an originally appointed to be on it. Well, Henry Kissinger was not just on it, but he was appointed to be the head of the entire commission. Um, the 9-11 widows, the victims' families were outraged by that, so they quickly replaced him with a guy named Philip Zelikow, who was basically a, a White House lackey who wrote a book with Condoleezza Rice um, on foreign policy. And then, uh, you know, several people resigned, or one person resigned, um, uh, Max Cleland from the commission at a protest. Um, I mean, the entire commission from the outset was set up to fail, and that was actually a statement made by the two people who ended up authoring the book um, that was put out, Lee Hamilton and King. Yeah, they actually did say it was mm -hmm. set up to fail from the beginning. I mean, it, it, took, it took months, longer than any other initiation of a commission after a major disaster or an event, and it was actually pushed by the widows, the families who said, why isn't this being investigated? It yeah. really was uh, you know, blocked from the very beginning, and they, when they finally were forced to investigate it, they put on Kissinger, then Zelikow, all these very close people, a lot of like airline lobbyists and lawyers as well. Um, let's talk about some of the glaring inconsistencies with the report itself, because because, you know, it just seems like they didn't really perform a real investigation. I mean, what do you think? Oh, absolutely not. I mean, the investigation was a total farce. Um, I mean, they, they wanted the investigation, the commission, to tell the story that they wanted to tell. And when I say they, I mean that the White House wanted to tell. Um, they omitted the war games that were going on on the day of 9-11 that showed that the air defense response was delayed because all the jet fighters were tied up with war games. Um, they omitted Building 7 falling. They omitted Able Danger, which was an investigation that had the identity of four hijackers as early as June of 2001 and knew that they were taking flying lessons. Uh, they omitted all of the warnings. Uh, before 9-11, except for the famous PDB memo, which says Bin Laden determined attack in the U.S. That's the tip of the iceberg. There were many other warnings that were extremely specific leading up to the events that were not mentioned in the commission. So, Robbie, what does this all say? I mean, obviously 9-11 was the crux of everything that we see today, the never-ending surveillance state, the curtailment of our civil liberties. I mean, do we need a new investigation? Do you think that they'll ever be held accountable? I mean, what, what do you think we should do here? I mean, a new investigation, best case scenario, would be done, you know, appointed by people in the government again. And obviously, the people who work in the government, the Obama White House now, they're not going to uncover that you know, scab, as Nixon says in the movie by Oliver Stone. You uncover that scab, and you get a lot of pus. And that's, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the case with the 9-11 Commission. If they did another one, um, it would be another cover-up. So my, I guess, for me, the only solution is just people just need to speak out about this 
and demand you know more answers. Well, I think the question is, what are they hiding? What what do all these things mean that they didn't cover in the investigation? We'll maybe we'll never know, but we definitely have to keep pushing for answers. Thank you so much, Robbie Martin from Media Roots. Thank you, Abby. Okay, well, I wouldn't worry so much about having a uh, you know another commission. I would well, I would want a real law enforcement agency to com to carry out a real genuine forensic criminal investigation uh no commissions no political appointments at all i want somebody who's a career law enforcement person who's not going to bow to the pressures of politics i don't know how we do that but the problem that we have are our representatives and the people that we choose to represent us in government are not doing us any favors when they cover up their wrongdoing. They're not doing us any favors when the, they privatize their armies and then the armies do wrongdoing, but they're, they're covered because the Constitution only limits what the government can do, not what private corporations can do. And uh, Blackwater, or Z, or whatever you want to call it, but, you know, the Blackwater mercenary group that formed and then got most of the contracts or it no bid contracts of course they didn't have any competition but uh they did extensive war crimes almost every time they went out they did war crimes and they've been you know charged and the charges have been dropped and then they've been charged again of different things well here's one more example of a cover-up we're going to go ahead and play this this is the finish up of the clip we just saw where amy martin's going to talk about the latest uh wash one hand washes the other of black water so let her rip <laughs> Well, guys, seems like our favorite military contractor, Blackwater, I mean Z, I mean Academy, whatever the hell they're calling themselves these days, is finally shedding some light on how deep their shady government connections really go. And as per usual, they're relieving themselves of any sort of accountability for their criminal actions of their personnel. After a three-year-long investigation last month, federal prosecutors dropped 15 felony charges against the Defense Corporation. Some of the indictments that were dismissed included the illegal purchase of automatic weapons, a charge that holds a prison sentence of two years. Of course, the company execs got a mere slap on the wrist and a small pittance fine of five grand. Why, you might ask? Well, because tens of thousands of court documents from the case revealed a close connection between the CIA and Blackwater. In fact, it's a relationship that was so close that Blackwater founder Eric Prince revealed in a recent interview that the firm took direct orders from the agency and became, quote, a virtual extension of the CIA. Take, for example, King Abdallah's of Jordan's visit to Blackwater headquarters in North Carolina back in 2005. At the end of his trip, Blackwater executives awarded Abdullah with modified rifles donned with Blackwater's logo. Yet it was uncovered that the weapons were legally given, and there was no paper trail showing the guns making it into the hands of the Jordanian king. But they ain't worried a paper trail, because it was revealed that the CIA had instructed Blackwater to give the king the guns, since, quote, the agency had forgotten to get gifts for him. Oops. Well, I'm glad mercenary thugs can pick up where the CIA leaves off. And since selling the company, that continues to be the line of defense used by Prince against the allegations. He said, quote, Blackwater carried out countless life-threatening missions for the CIA, and in return, the government chose to prosecute my people for doing exactly what was asked of them. Basically, Blackwater was just acting under orders of the CIA, so if anyone should be held accountable, it's them. Look, I never thought that I would agree with Prince, but I can't say I disagree with the fact that the CIA is ultimately responsible for outsourcing their death squads to private mercenary corporations who commit their dirty, detestable deeds under a cloak of impunity. Plus, passing the buck to the CIA is a brilliant move, since we'll surely see no prosecutions or indictments coming out of this ever-elusive agency. So let me get this straight. Lawless mercenaries acting on behalf of the U.S. government committed blatant war crimes, ran around war zones, and acted as though they are above the law. And now we know why. Because they are. <laughs> but this goes far beyond just giving guns to royalty. Think back to 2007, where four Blackwater employees walked away scot-free after massacring 17 civilians and injuring 20 others in Iraq. 
Oh, and how could one forget the video of the firm in Baghdad driving cars off the road, shooting at random civilians? Also, yep, from smuggling arms to murdering children, their list of crimes goes on and on, many of which we'll probably never know about. But hey, in the two-tiered justice system, impunity for war crimes is just the name of the game, with the CIA pulling the strings. Okay, well, that's just the way it is. You can commit the crime and get away with it. You know, if I hired the mafia to bump off somebody, my wife or something, if I had a wife, whatever, the, it isn't just the guy that did the bumping off that gets arrested. He gets arrested and he says, well, Bill Olson hired me. And then Bill Olson would get prosecuted for that. So what I want to know is, okay, Blackwater says, well, the CIA hired us. Why don't we prosecute the CIA? Well, because they're the most powerful organization in the world. Okay, well, people say, why do we want to, why do we keep worrying about 9-11? So what if it's corrupt? So what? Well, everything about, that affects you is being changed because of 9-11. All our freedoms are being stripped away. And here's Amy Martin to tell you about no freedoms since 9-11. I guess we're not quite ready for that, but There we go. When America was founded as a republic, the Constitution of the United States and the 10 original amendments called the Bill of Rights were unique and completely revolutionary in the world. Ours was the first system that enshrined the people to govern themselves, a type of government for the people by the people. The Bill of Rights cemented our civil liberties. And these are the rights that should never be threatened, undermined, or revoked. But hey, we live in a post 9-11 world now where we're told by politicians and an unquestioning media that we, were that we were attacked because we're the greatest democracy and had the most freedom in the world. But instead of preserving this bastion of freedom, our government opportunistically seized upon 9-11 to systematically pass legislation that eroded our most fundamental freedoms. Our representatives argued that sacrifices would have to be made in order to protect us from terrorism. Take a look. This is liberty within order, order within uh, that protects uh, liberty. I think that the, uh, what the USA Patriot and all law enforcement activity does is try to protect our country, its foundation of law and order at a time when that security is missing in our world because of terrorists and because of criminals. Unfortunately, we may not always be able to tell you why that agent or agents are knocking on your door. And that is because of the nature of this investigation. I hope that you would understand that. Are we going to compromise civil rights for national security? Is there a chance that some of your civil liberties may slip while we guarantee the security of this country? Maybe. 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 Sacrificing liberty for security. That doesn't sound like a good trade-off. In fact, one of the founding fathers of this country, Benjamin Franklin, once said, he who sacrifices liberty for security deserves neither. But let's get back to what actually passed. The first piece of legislation was now, get ready for this doozy, the United and Strengthening America by providing appropriate tools required to intercept and obstruct terrorism act of 2001, then updated in 2006, better known as the USA Patriot Act. And man, Orwell would be rolling in his grave if he could see the double speak coming from the establishment on this one. Because, you see, the Patriot Act was probably one of the most unpatriotic pieces of legislation ever passed, since it overrode so many of our rights, namely the 1st, 4th, 5th, 6th, 8th, and 14th Amendments. And members of Congress only had seven hours to read the 345-page bill before voting on it. Now, the Patriot Act allowed unauthorized searches and seizures, massive surveillance and access of all your personal information, all under the guise of preventing terrorism. It also widened the NSA's surveillance powers, but don't worry, I'm sure the NSA officials understand that they need probable cause before they search people's homes, right? Check out what Michael Hayden, former director of the NSA, had to say about it. 
My understanding is that the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution specifies that you must have probable cause to be able to do a, a, a search that does not violate an American's right against uh, unlawful seizures and sur uh, searches and seizures. Actually, do you, the uh, Fourth you, Amendment actually uh, protects all of us against unreasonable search and seizure. But, that's the, what, the, but that's the, what it says. the measure is probable cause, I believe. The amendment says unreasonable search and seizure. But does it not say probable? The, no. the, the, the court standard, the legal standard, search and the legal standard is probable cause. Actually, it does say probable cause, Michael. So you might want to read up on the Constitution and the amendments. Oh, but joy, it looks like these top brass of these agencies allotted to protecting this country don't even have a grasp on basic civics. That certainly makes me feel a whole lot better. So here, let me break it down some more for you. Starting with the Bush Doctrine, a phrase used to describe policy that basically said the U.S. has the right to preemptively invade a nation if they suspect that this nation may be a threat in the future. This was ultimately used to justify the invasion of Afghanistan. So essentially, the Bush Doctrine was a solid attempt to indoctrinate us into thinking that preemptive war is the right thing to do. Then it was FISA, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. It was originally instated to provide electronic surveillance for foreign intelligence, but it's so loosely defined, all it does pretty much is to provide justification to spy on pretty much anyone and everyone. And if you were at all inspired by the coming together of people from the Occupy Wall Street movement this year, last year, then you'll be very disheartened to know that Bill H.R. 347, a.k.a. the Federal Restricted Buildings and Grounds Improvement Act, practically makes protesting near public officials a federal offense. Yep, the closest thing we've seen to banning public protests thus far. And most disturbingly, the National Defense Authorization Act, which was signed by Obama on New Year's Eve when America was literally drunk. The bill not only loosely defines the word terrorist, but it also allows for the indefinite detention of American citizens without due process. Not having due process sets America back about eight centuries. So here we are, 11 years after 9-11, and I'm left with nothing but questions and faced with nothing but hypocrisy. The government told all of us that this was necessary to protect us from terrorism, but if that were true, why are they using all of this to terrorize us? Okay, why are they using all of this to terrorize us? Didn't she nail it? The thing I like about Amy Martin is she expresses the outrage that we all feel. I mean, government officials, if you're watching this, you're not doing us any favors by, by oppressing us. What are you so afraid of? And buying two billion bullets, the government buying two billion bullets, which would be, if they carried out wars for 10 years, they wouldn't even use up two billion bullets. But the bullets they bought aren't even legal to use in war under the rules of war. They're hollow points, de deliberately desert, de designed to kill. Now you'd think, well, that's not what you do in war. You're not supposed to maim and kill. You're supposed to take the, art, the other side out, hopefully, without killing them. Well, anyway... It's kind of stupid to talk about rules of war. Wars are a tool of politics, and they should never be allowed. When you see a war, it's not because somebody's trying to right an oppression. It's because there's a political power struggle going on, and the war is what they're using to settle it. Well, we're going to... You, if you don't understand that we're being prepped for a police state. If you don't understand we're already in a police state, well, watch this next clip. Here's Amy Martin talking about preparing for a police state. Imagine this scenario. You're sitting in your house, you're kicking back, you're watching TV, and all of a sudden you hear the deafening sound of machine gun fire from low-flying helicopters overhead. You'd probably be a little startled. Hell, you might even think that World War III was going down. Well, the black helicopters flying above might not come as a surprise if you live right here in D.C., but if you live in any other U.S. city, this probably isn't norm. But that could be changing. Take a look at what happened in Miami last week. Happening now in downtown Miami, Black Hawk choppers soaring through the night sky, but this is only a drill. My team's Mike Marza has some pictures for us explaining what's going on. Mike? 
Still, if you've seen one of these drills, it really is like a scene out of one of those action movies, choppers stalking the sky or downtown Miami and the like. Helicopters came by and I was filming up, taking some pictures, and then I just heard all this machine gun firing and I hit the deck. I, I didn't know what to expect and um, it was a lot, one of the loudest things I ever heard. Yeah, it probably hit the deck too, but this didn't just happen in Miami. Take a look at how residents reacted to the same kind of drills going on in Houston. With military helicopters flying above her southeast Houston neighborhood, Frances Geralds didn't know what to think. You know, when you see this, you think the worst. Right. When you hear this, you think the worst. And so she passed along her concern. She told me, don't come home because it sounded like we're in a war zone. Guns shooting and helicopters flying around over the house. The Army, along with other agencies, had taken over the old Carnegie Vanguard High School. There were armed men in fatigues, plenty of weapons, and what many thought were real live rounds. Gee, ain't that comforting? And although police sent out a warning that there would be a joint military training exercise, there was no mention of when and where it would happen. In a statement by Miami police, they said, quote, this is a routine training conducted by military personnel designed to ensure the military's ability to operate in urban environments. Routine training? It's funny. I don't remember police and military firing machine guns in my neighborhood growing up. And is it really necessary to simulate military operations that scare the living dickens out of people? You know, this reminds me of when I lived in Oakland during the police crackdown of Occupy. There was a two-week period where there were about five police helicopters constantly hovering above my neighborhood. And after a couple days, I seriously started losing sleep and becoming severely stressed and paranoid as I started to become conditioned to live in what had become a militarized police state. So all of this really begs the question, why is the U.S. starting to condition us to be comfortable living in a constant state of fear, surveillance, and military aggression? What are they really planning for? Ta-da, I'm back. Yeah, no, I was just taking a little break there. No, okay, so helicopters flying over conditioning you for oppression so that the more military jackbooted police in military full riot gear all the time i mean come on that's conditioning 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 and that is anybody that's old enough to understand all of that is anti-american and they're conditioning you to understand that is american now that's that's it's a tragedy but it gets even worse drones and helicopters guess what they've got now Mini drones, little bitty drones that they drop out in bucketfuls and they, well, let's let Amy Martin tell you all about it. You know, I was having a pretty great day yesterday. Then I saw this sponsored video from General Dynamics, one of the leading defense contractors in the U.S. about their new micro drones that are about to hit the market. Micro air vehicles, or MAVs, will play an important role in future warfare. The urban battlefield calls for tools to increase the warfighter's situational awareness and capacity to engage rapidly, precisely, and with minimal collateral damage. MAVs will be integrated into future Air Force layered sensing systems. These systems may be airdropped or hand launched depending on the mission requirements. I'm sorry, did that plane just shoot out a bunch of little tiny drones? Terrifying, <laughs> really terrifying. So these micro air vehicles or MAVs are designed to deal with urban battlefields with rapid precision. The question is what urban battles are military fighting that they need this kind of creepy technology? And forget about shooting these things down, they're about this big. The small size of MAVs allows them to be hidden in plain sight. Once in place, an MAV can enter a low-powered extended surveillance mode for missions lasting days or weeks. This may require the MAV to harvest energy from environmental sources, such as sunlight or wind, or from man-made sources, such as power lines and vibrating machinery. Hidden in plain sight on missions that could last weeks? Powered by the sun or power lines? And did you see that little Terminator-looking pigeon? My God! Orwell would be rolling in his grave if he could see the absurdly dystopic reality we're about to be living in. But their small size is not just to linger undetected outdoors. 
It's also to gain access inside. Small size and agile flight will enable MAVs to covertly enter locations inaccessible by traditional means of aerial surveillance. Multiple MAVs, each equipped with small sensors, will work together to survey a large area. Information from these sensors will be combined, providing this swarm of MAVs with a big picture point of view. Hmm, maybe these places are not conducive to traditional surveillance methods because it's supposed to be illegal to surveil people's homes without a warrant. And also, how frightening is it to think of a swarm of these little robots coming at you in a dark hallway? Nowhere to run, nowhere to hide, they see all. They communicate together, offering this big picture image to whoever's sitting on the other end of the screen. Can anyone say Minority Report? Because this is literally what this country's turning into. And if that isn't chilling enough, sit tight, because it's about to get worse. While some MAVs may be used purely for visual reconnaissance, others may be used for targeting or tagging of sensitive locations. Individual MAVs may perform direct attack missions and can be equipped with incapacitating chemicals, combustible payloads, or even explosives for precision targeting capability. Wow. So if the surveillance fails, then these mini robots can and will set off explosives, chemical agents, and even assassinate human beings. At whose direction? Obama? The same person who has targeted the execution of a 16-year-old without due process? Gee, that's comforting. But doesn't it make you feel safer knowing that this technology will soon be in the hands of our military and defense contractors? The same defense contractors that rape and kill with impunity? But will these MAVs really be used everywhere in the future of warfare? MAVs will become a vital element in the ever-changing warfighting environment and will help ensure success on the battlefield of the future. Unobtrusive, pervasive, lethal, micro-air vehicles, enhancing the capabilities of the future warfighter. Unobtrusive, pervasive, and lethal. So, welcome to the brave new world, kids, and watch out for bugs, because the next time you try to kill a fly, it might kill you first. Might kill you first. Yeah, now, they're militarizing everything, including robots. I mean, they're planning right now, the, the written plans that you can go look up yourself if you're interested, are to replace human beings completely in the army and the military with robots, whether they're robots on the ground that run like the chief. And we had those on other shows recently. And uh, now they got these, well, I mean, Americans have been oblivious to our treacherous slaughter of innocents overseas with our drone program and the president's assassination program. All of these things are illegal to anybody who has a brain, and yet we're letting them get away with it. If you're a politician, you're not helping us by letting them get away with those things. But it gets worse. Okay, imagine that you're an activist and in this case the story is about a woman activist who got a boyfriend who she met at one of these get-togethers for protesting something they became boyfriend girlfriend for four years and then she found out he was an undercover cop just stringing her along trying to bust her for four years we're gonna play that video now sorry about the microphones there I, we're gonna play that video watch this this is a <laughs> I often talk about FBI entrapment of Muslims on this show. There's one aspect of entrapment that I haven't discussed yet. Law enforcement's infiltration of peace and activist groups all across the country, targeting everyday people like you and me. Recently, a FOIA request revealed that the FBI have extensively been spying on the Occupy Wall Street movement. And they did this in a variety of ways, including infiltration and others. I'm going to mention just a few of the instances we now know about, but there are probably countless more. On the first anniversary of Occupy, seven members of an Occupy group in Austin, Texas, were faced with felony charges and up to two years in prison over an act of civil disobedience resulting from a case of police entrapment. They were calling for a shutdown of a local seaport in solidarity with union groups. Seven protesters blocked the entry of the port, 
and use lock boxes made of PVC pipes to link their arms together to form a human chain. They were then all charged with unlawful use of a criminal instrument. However, it was later discovered that three undercover cops had been involved in not only the purchasing, but designing, assembling, and ultimately providing demonstrators with the lock boxes used in the demonstration. Yep, the whole shebang, the materials, the plan, and the egregious felony charge, all hatched by the cops. But this is nothing new. Entrapment of activists happens all the time. Remember the case of the Cleveland Five, where federal agents posing as activists encouraged them to commit violence and even arranged the purchase of fake bombs to blow up a bridge? Or what about how undercover cops tried to convince a group of demonstrators to commit an act of terror during the latest NATO summit? But when that didn't work, they planted incriminating materials in their Chicago apartment. Those four activists are still being held under charges related to domestic terrorism. Although entrapment methods are becoming more pervasive by the day in this expanding police state, this is in no way an innovative tool for law enforcement. During the 60s and 70s, federal intelligence used undercover agents to infiltrate and entrap peaceful activists. Under Operation Chaos, the U.S. government targeted students in an attempt to halt the growth of the anti-war movement under the Johnson and Nixon administrations. However, one of the most hostile crackdowns on dissent was with a program called COINTELPRO, where the FBI made aggressive attempts to disrupt and discredit numerous political groups through smear campaigns, false media reports, harassment, and full-blown psychological warfare. Many say the program is still alive and well today. But, over, but of course, the government claims these tactics are done all in the name of national security. What else would they say? But so how far are these security agencies willing to go to protect the status quo? Well, what if a person you were intimately involved with for years, one that you were living with, sleeping with, turned out to be an undercover agent? living a double life, and in many instances married with other families, simply using you to build a case against your cause for years. Now, as horrifying as this scenario sounds, this is actually commonplace. The Guardian recently reported that a woman involved in a peaceful left-wing political group had lived with an undercover cop for four years. Once the man suddenly vanished from her life, she discovered his true identity. And when she testified about feeling betrayed and humiliated, she said, quote, This is not about just a lying boyfriend or a boyfriend who has cheated on you. It's about a fictional character who was created by the state and funded by taxpayer money. And you know, that's just the point. It's not just the dehumanization of you and your friends being watched and used for years. It's the fact that we're funding this. <laughs> we're paying police to have sex with activists, to entrap peaceful protesters, and to stage phony threats. They say it's a matter of national security. I say it's betrayal in its purest form. Hi, well, they just pile it on. We're back here and Marcella has joined me from Portland, architects and engineers for 9-11 truth the portland branch and uh we've opened up the phone lines 288-4448 feel free to call up and ask us any questions or vent your frustration about things that we've just shown whatever in the meantime uh there's a, an event coming up on the 11th of april is that what it um, is on the on the 9th of april oh it, 9th of april um yeah we have three events in in april we have free library presentations of the dvd uh 9-11 Ex explosive evidence experts speak out and uh, they're from 6 to 8 p.m. and in April we're going to be having three library presentations free, li free library presentations um, April 9th Tuesday April 9th at the Selwood Morley Library Thursday April 25th at the Hillsdale Library and Tuesday April 20th at the Hollywood Library and please go to our website Portland AE 911truth.org for um for those you know f for those mentions again and also for their locations and you're also provided a map um to help you get there so please go again to portland ae 911 truth.org um for and we actually have dates for april and also dates for may and again at the free library presentation you get a, a d you get a free dvd of the movie you just saw at the end of the presentation um and after the q a yeah that's you know what a 
10 or $20 value depending on who you buy it from. <laughs> And yeah, and, and, and you can make, um, you know, and, and, and we can help supply you with other um, DVDs so you can spread it to friends. And we, we just try and help you. We, we try and educate you or and we try and um, um, uh, encourage you to then be an educator, even to educate one other person. Now, some of you are watching this on the World Wide Web right now, but uh, those of you watching on cable access, as you're probably aware, over the last few weeks, they've been showing the first three out of five of the uh, Toronto hearings on 9-11. Um, really, really good videos to watch. Each one's an hour or more. They've shown the first three, and I just submitted the final two, so they'll be coming on real soon. So be sure to watch your TV guide for that. We have a caller. And so, hello, caller. Hi, caller. If you're on, please. Hey, pardon yeah. my brain. By the way, can you hear me okay? Yes, yes. we hear you. Hello? Yes. yes. Yeah, we hear you fine. I can't hear you if you're saying anything. Oh, he'll turn up the mics in just no. a second. Hello, can you, can you hear us? You're saying anything. Oh, he'll turn up the mics in just a second. <laughs> Feel free to talk. Uh, it, I hear the background. You got your TV turned up. Uh, you got to hit the mute button now because you guys just yeah, on, messed it up for me. On Aux, um, Aux 4, we have to sit. Turn, yes. Yeah, we hear you fine. I can't hear you at all. Yes, you okay. can hear you. Well, you go ahead and answer it. I'll go. Yes. I cannot hear a, a single thing coming out of your end of the phone. But I'll just make this comment and make it quick. Um, that cop that uh, slept with that lady for four years and... Um, sounds like a thunder or something. If you can still hear this, I hope he caught the clap or some kind of social disease that stays with him forever. And anybody else that does that kind of dirty tricks they should get a social disease too and and maybe you can wish that upon them i don't know i don't know if it's possible but if it is uh, they they deserve it anyway thanks for all the good work you guys do there and uh, just a humorous thought on my part i hope the guy got the clap or something worse <laughs> did you by the way do you, can you hear us now yes i can hear you now bill okay good we're in good shape then sorry so about all that anything i said i heard a bunch of noise on your end but in case you didn't hear my statement was I had a humorous thought about that guy who uh, slept with that poor woman for four <laughs> years just to uh, get her in jail. And um, what? I hope he got some kind of long-lasting social disease. <laughs> yeah, well, that I hope she didn't have one. Hope she didn't. Yeah, get yeah. One. I, I, you know, but if, if I mean that's one he deserves. Anybody else that does anything like he did, they deserve that. So. That's the only humor side of this whole thing I can think of is that uh, maybe, uh, you know, the, the old saying, time wounds all heels. Oh. And so he was a heel for doing that. that but, absolutely. Uh, anyway, well, hey, thanks for all the extra good work you guys do and uh, keep thing going there. By the way, one real quick uh, thing that I know some people will bitch about. Um, the woman on Russia Today, she brings up a lot of very valid points. But does anybody do the same kind of show about Russia? For crying out loud, that stinking place. I mean, they say that uh, if a man makes it to by the age of 30, I heard this the other day on the radio, and I think it was on KBOO, but I'm not sure. But uh, by the time they get into their 30s, they've had three major health crises. Oh. You know, with diseases, mostly disease like uh, bacterial lung infections and stuff like that, just because of the whole damp, crappy conditions over there. Yeah, well, you, you can't blame that on the Russians because the IMF and the other yeah, world the monetary other people tore them up. There. I mean, it's, it's still just a corrupt, you know, uh, place. So yeah, people, I'd, like to see this, I'd like to see somebody expose all the dirt on Russia. Yeah. And I appreciate the fact that Russia today is exposing the dirt on us. I think uh, yeah. more dirt that's excavated and thrown out where everybody can see it is, uh, is a, a good thing. And... Um, but uh, I know there are some people out there who are probably calling BS on, well, who in the hell are these Russian today? Yeah, they'll Look talk about Russia. Pravda. Things, you know? And it's one of the most uh, toxic waste sites around with Chernobyl, but hell, uh, Hanford isn't far behind that, you know what I mean, Vern? Yeah. Okay, well, thanks, caller. Anyway, you guys take care. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Right on. Thanks. Well, we got so many things going wrong you know but the idea you're right i've had people criticize me they say well you know pravda do you, don't you remember what pravda did they were the liars of propaganda of russia well the toilet paper of record uh the washington 
or the New York Times, I mean, that's the, the <laughs> toilet paper of record. Uh, already is our propaganda wing. You know, nothing they've put out is, you know, anywhere near believable. They were instrumental in the 9-11 cover-up, along with other media. Well, anyway, so you, have you got any thoughts on our... Well, at, at the police free, state world. <laughs> um, well, no. Well, just um, just mentioning that the free library presentations, the DVD that I that we show, which is again entitled "9 11 Explosive Evidence: Experts Speak Out." Um, it, it's a focus on what happens in New York City, and it goes over um, and explains how um, three skyscrapers fell that day, and um, Building Seven fell at about 5:20 p.m. that day, and um, and how um, and and we um. And Richard Gage, the founder of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth, he uses the, the scientific method to show you um, how those three buildings were brought down with explosive evidence. I mean, yeah, w like to, with explosions. I'm going, like the next show, um, one, one of the friends of our show, Jimmy Moglio, who has a show on cable access, uh, what was it, Orwell or something, I forget. It was like a 1984 show. I, I'm sorry, Jimmy, I blew your, the name of your show, but... People can find it if they want to, but he called me up and pointed out that another one of the 9-11 uh, whistleblowers or 9-11 activists has died under mysterious circumstances. Uh, I didn't didn't have my notes. This is a guy that I, he's written two or three books about 9-11, and I don't have any of them. I'm really not that familiar with the guy, but I'm going to be doing a show on it next week, or April 6th is our next show. We have a caller. We have a caller. <laughs> oh, that caller was boring. Let's <laughs> well, so, feel, feel free to call in, though. You can call yeah, in right now and ask questions or inform us or however you would like to. And in the meantime, you know, what, I, what I'm thinking of doing is putting together a little speech. Oh, okay, I'll t talk more about it after this caller. We have a caller. Please speak up. Yeah, Bill, you hear me there? Oh, yeah, I hear you just fine. Yeah, oh, right on. I can hear you, too. Uh, I want to thank you very much for the uh, airings of the uh, Toronto uh, programs. Mm -hmm. I uh, have not been able to catch all of them. I caught, I think, day two, and uh, I heard you uh, mention that you have the uh, the submission for the uh, day, what, uh, four and five coming up? Mm -hmm. Right. And I was wondering... No, it's day three and um, four. The first one was an introduction, so there were four days with a half-hour introduction one at the beginning. So it was zero through four. <laughs> Okay, so so what uh, what my question is, uh, I'm I'm really hoping that uh, the the first that the entire series will be played at and uh, that the uh, the airings of the ones that have uh, shown already, uh, I hope that they're not being uh, put back on the shelf never to be shown again because no, I, uh, I, I really look forward to being able to. Uh, coordinate my sit down time with your TV airings and, uh, oh, yeah. and watch them all the way through. Well, but, uh, I always I check the box. Thank you very much for, for airing those and I'll hang up and take your uh, comments off the air. Okay. Thank you. I was just going to say I always check the box on our submission form that allows us allows them to use it as filler and that winds up being rebroadcast over and over again. We have another caller. Caller, if you want to speak up. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> Go ahead, caller. Hello? Yes. Hi. Hey, I have two questions for you guys. I'm wondering if you can talk on two topics. One of fluoride in Portland and what's going on with that, to your knowledge, and also uh, chemtrails, and if there's any action being taken on that in this area. Well, I'd like to say, first of all, that that's off topic, um, but I will take a moment to, to make a comment. First of all, um, the other day I took... I saw an airplane flying, and it had a regular comm trail that that just disappeared as as the plane flew. The comm trail only stayed about that long, and the plane flying way, way up there. And so I took a little video of it. I might show it next time. But you can tell when you're talking about these chemtrails, those are real. I, I was a skeptic, but Alex Jones said, here are the patent numbers. Go check it out yourself. And I said, all right, wise I asked, so I'll go do it. And I got on the internet and patent office, typed in those patents, and sure enough, they were patents for sending chemicals through the jet burning process and coming out and using it to geoengineer. And you can tell those from the comm trails because they don't dissipate. And you'll usually see them in a grid pattern. I couldn't believe it the other day, a grid pattern. Airplanes don't fly in a grid pattern. They fly specific routes all the time. 
and the grid pattern means they specifically did that engineering. But, uh, and then what was the and other? And fluoride. Oh, fluoride. I've already shown a 45 minute show of James Corbett uh, produced. He's a Japanese, uh, he's an American Japanese <laughs> uh, journalist, and he put out one called Portland versus Fluoride. Now, we're coming up to a vote in May. Everybody must vote, no, we don't want poison in our... This is another thing about politicians. You're not doing us a favor by poisoning our water. You get too many bribes, and you think poisoning the water is okay? Too many bribes, and you think it's okay to send drones everywhere? Too many bribes, it's okay to assassinate people? I mean, I'm going off. <laughs> well, we have a caller. If, yeah, the caller if the caller's still there, please speak up. Okay, caller. Okay. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yes. Okay. For what it's worth, Jimmy Mogula's two shows, one was called Shakespeare's Views on the News, and the other one was called Orwell Today. Thank you, thank you. And, and then the other thing is, we have, <laughs> people both worried different. about drones, we have surveillance planes and have had so in the metropolitan area, the Portland metropolitan area, the Tri-County area, for at least the last six years. I first noticed it four years ago, but another source of... Uh, which I won't cite right now, but he told me that it was basically been six years. Well, and he already knew what I was talking about before the words even came out of my mouth. Even officially, anyway, th three uh, years ago, it's, even it's like a, it looks like a uh, God, I hate this system. regular old kind of like a uh, Cessna 172. They actually use two or three different planes, and they fly over sometimes 24 hours a day. And um, it's uh, one has a turbo on it. Uh, it has kind of a turbo sound to the engine. But they're off-white color most of the time, at least ones I've seen, high-wing type of plane, single engine. Mm -hmm. And one of them has uh, fairly white, blue, navy blue stripes at each wing tip and on its belly of the fuselage. And so keep an eye out for those babies, but pretty soon uh, they'll probably be replaced with much quieter drones. Well, just... And so, uh, <sighs> which if you're going to spy on us, at least don't... Uh, you know, we're supposed to have a 6 go nuts cut. all day long with your stupid sound that never goes away. And these planes fly very slow. You'll notice them just kind of just putting along, just barely above stall speed. And I had one of my neighbors check on. He's a private pilot, and he saw one flying over the neighborhood here uh, two summers ago, and it was going in a big circle, and he thought I would have had a stroke or something, some kind of medical emergency. So he went and called the FAA. It took him, he finally, when he got through to the fourth person, that he got to through got to through on the phone they uh told him it was a law enforcement plane but <laughs> supposedly i said which branch of law enforcement was it and he said he said he didn't know but who knows if he knows or not you know but the point of it is is that at least if they're going to spy on us at least i'd rather have it quiet you know but uh it, it really pisses me off to even the thought of them spying on us 24 7 uh, let alone uh, insulting us with their obnoxious noise 24-7. Right well, thanks for calling, and uh, I just wanted to say that the, uh, you know, even just three years ago, I think, maybe even less than that, but it's now official. I mean, the Willamette Week came out talking about the Portland-based drones. They didn't yeah. They didn't want to say where the uh, <laughs> the base was located, but... By the way, I have a quick hunch on uh, which the organization... Now, keep in mind, this is just a hunch. It's a theory. So I'm not accusing anybody directly, you know. But uh, I wonder where the money came in for the lobbyists to pay off the city council and the mayor. On the floor? And the new, some of the new city council members. You I mean, mean for Floyd? I was a guy who was for the little guy, you know. Hello. Oh. Oh. But he's just a, uh, I think he's <laughs> it's a, not a two -way bozo, conversation you know, anymore. he's a uh, overpaid corporate bozo like the rest of them. I have yeah. a, 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 a rotten feeling that that's the case. I hope it isn't true. Okay, thanks, I, caller. Yeah, thanks. Uh, that's enough. Thank you. God, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to make a comment back, and you guys in there are supposed to shut them off when I'm trying to make a comment. We have another caller. Sorry, caller. I was trying to get a word in edgewise, but maybe next time you'll let me talk. Uh, okay. Well, so we, we, we have another we caller. We have another caller. That's, we can't. Do, we got four minutes left, so make him all the sunshines. I have a comment about the fluoride it's the uh, it's also in toothpaste and mouthwash you know it does absorb through your skin and uh it's not only in your water you know it's in everything that they put in our food and products you know that you know you gotta look out for but also i was just wondering what you thought about uh the government food. and these underground facilities that, that that's on the internet that i that's not they're hiding stuff what do you think about that? Uh, that's too vague. I don't know what you're saying. 
mean, I don't know. <clears throat> well, for some reason, I you look on YouTube and there's like these underground facilities that the government's hiding, like. Oh yeah, it, for it, getting ready for crapping or something for some reason. Con continuation of government and like that, the the elite that are stockpiling weapons and stockpiling ammo. And right. building these shelters, they're afraid of us. They've they've committed so many crimes. They're afraid that we are going to be demanding justice. And when we demand justice, their asses are in jail. And so that's that's why they're building those shelters, and that's why they're hoarding bullets and and trying to limit our ability. By the way, there's a gun show going on right this weekend. So folks, before you can't buy your guns, if you have any money, get down there and you know make another record sale at the gun show. Uh, the Second Amendment is seriously threatened, and if if anybody starts talking to you about a gun safety argument, tell them that's bull feathers. That's that's not an argument. That's not a valid argument at all. This is not about gun safety. It's about the Second Amendment and keeping our government honest. And anybody that says it's something else is a liar, because by now they've been fully informed by many of us about the Second Amendment if they didn't have the knowledge in the first place. I suspect that they were fully aware and are just dirty liars. So anybody that that starts this argument about gun safety and I'm worried about the children that have been slaughtered, those folks are either terminally stupid or they're vicious liars. There's nothing in between. Okay? Uh, have I made my point clear on that? <laughs> um, you, you've been watching Bill's show, which is 9-11 was an inside job and other state crimes against democracy. Yeah, so we are talking about and, state crimes against democracy, yeah, so it's and, okay. And it airs the first and third Saturday of every month. And That's so right. we'll see you in two weeks. And, 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 on the 6th. Yes, on the sixth of yes of April, and um and and I'm with Architects and Engineers for 9/11 Truth, the Portland chapter, and we'll be having free library presentations three in April, two in May, and um, please go to our website portlandae911truth.org for for the listings and locations. Um, um, Tuesday, April 9th, we'll be having at the Selwood Moreland Library uh, a presentation. Uh, Thursday, April 25th, at the Hillsdale Library. Tuesday, April 30th, at the Ho Hollywood Library. Um, and, and we'll remind you on the 6th. And we'll remind you on the 6th again. So now we have one minute left to go, and we'll be just showing the credits. But uh, remember on the 6th, we're going to be talking about the mysterious deaths of many of the 9-11 in info or whistleblower types, including Danny Joenko, who was the uh, demolitions expert who said, yeah, without a doubt, Building 7 controlled demolition. And then, of course, Barry Jennings, who was the hero that saved so many people, and then his mysterious death before he could give a, you know, on record, uh, under oath testimony. So anyway, we'll see you next time. Yeah, and um, and just um, Richard Gage, who's the founder of Architects and Engineers for 9/11 Truth, will be here in Portland in in June. And so we'll try to have him on this show. Yeah, we'll and, see. Yeah, so, so <laughs> go to our well, it, it'll be mentioned, but yeah, we're trying to get him here in June. Okay, so again, that's seconds. Richard Gage. Um, but see you in two weeks. Um, yeah.